Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. We're getting ready to get started. Good afternoon. I'm Patty Mabry. I'm the executive director for the Indiana University Network Science Institute. And if you're one of our affiliates, welcome. If you're not yet an affiliate, please join us. You can go to our website and uh, push the join um, as an, become an affiliate button. I just have a few short announcements before we get to the main uh, entree of the day. Uh, Jason Moore, exciting talk ahead. Um, but I did want to give you a few updates since our last time that we met you, which would have been last spring sometime. It's been a while. So one is that we now have, we're very pleased um, to announce that uh, NSF has made the NRT Award, the National Research Traineeship Award. So this is, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a dual PhD in complex networks and systems and another second PhD in sociology, neuroscience, cognitive science, or political science. And um, Luis Roca is our uh, PI, lead PI for that. There's also Cotty Borner, Bernice Pesco Salito, Armando Razo, and Olaf Sporns are also PIs. So if you know any of them or see them around, give them a congratulations. We also have new students. Uh, who are the NRT students who are here? If you want to just quickly raise your hand. One, two, three of them. Okay, excellent. We're building our class. And um, you'll hear from these folks um, in probably in a few weeks or a month or so once we can get um, something going to introduce the NRT in more depth. But we do have, I believe the applications, Luis, are in December. Is that correct? December 1st. So I would talk to Luis right away if you're interested in applying. And maybe what we can do is get some information from you to post on our website to get folks uh, to apply. Uh, and let's see, what else do we have? Um, we have the rest of the Network Science Talk series. Um, so far we have um, Natish, uh, Natesh Chawa from University of Notre Dame will be here on November the 7th. And Anna Mueller will be here December 4th. Um, we're also going to have an uh, open science meeting on, I didn't write down the date. Um, I'm sorry, do you know the date for the open science meeting with, uh, is it um, Angela Zoss? November 1st, okay. Angela Zoss will be presenting. Um, and then we also will have an upcoming open science meeting where you can meet our research scientists. So we have several new folks. The three new people want to raise your hand, Alice um, Patania, okay. And we have uh, Kate Eddins. And Hank Green is somewhere, right over here. Okay, so um, be sure to reach out to these folks. There are new research scientists. Um, that's, I think, it other than, oh, very important, small but important. A thanks to everyone who put this together. Ann McCraney, right here. Um, Susan Thee and Lourdes Gonzalez, you want to raise your hand? Thank you for putting this together. Um, Ann, um, our Assistant Director for Research Administration, will now take over introducing Jason Moore. Thank you very much. Hi, thanks for um, being here today. We also uh, appreciate the folks who are um, joining us via video stream online. Um, so we have a, a, a group that's uh, joining, so you're being beamed out right now. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Jason Moore. He is, as you can see, the, um, he is the director of the Institute of the Biomedical Informatics. He's the founding director at the University of Pennsylvania. Also the head of the Computational Genetics Lab um, there, did I just say that? Okay. At the School of Medicine. Um, he has a lot of different uh, uh, research interests. Um, I think he's going to highlight his in artificial intelligence and machine learning today. Um, but of course, his uh, career got started with um, computational genetics as well. And that's going to be, I know, something that lots of you are um, interested in um, talking to him about or hearing. So I welcome you to stick around for the reception that we have afterwards because we have him as captive audience for about an hour. Um, he... Uh, also, his work obviously um, intersects as well with network science, so I hope that that's going to come across um, today. But there are many different ways that network science has come into play at his work. So this is just, I think, one of the of the many parts here. One of the um, things that I wanted to highlight to you, um, in addition to being um, very busy with his uh, very active line of research, he's also uh, administrative head of his institute, and a master tweeter. So uh, step up your game, folks um, who are here on Twitter. Follow him online. Uh, become one of his 17,600 followers that he has as of today. I just checked. Um, we want to see that go up. So uh, I'm super impressed with this. So uh, with uh, no further ado, I'll introduce him here for his talk on uh, network science, a role for network science and artificial intelligence. Thanks for being here.
Great, thank you, uh, Ann. Um, it is a, a real pleasure to be here uh, in Bloomington. This is my first time to Bloomington. I've been to Indianapolis several times, but uh, coming to Indiana University to this campus has been on my short list of universities to visit for a very long time. And I can, I can say that the, uh, the campus is even more beautiful than I ever imagined. So I can tell it's a real privilege for all of you to uh, live and work here. Um, what I'd like to do today is tell you about some of our new work uh, in the area of artificial intelligence, specifically for uh, data science, data analysis using machine learning methods, and, and the theme is going to be accessible, open, and user-friendly artificial intelligence. Uh, and then hopefully there'll be time at the end, I want to circle back to network science, which I'm also very passionate about, and I think there's a tremendous role for network science to play in the emerging areas of machine learning. And, and artificial intelligence. So I'm a head of a biomedical informatics institute, so this is the world that I focus on uh, day in and day out, and, and published this editorial uh, uh, last year with John Holmes, uh, making the argument that this is the golden era of biomedical informatics, and I think you could extend that to informatics more, more generally, uh, or data science, if you consider yourself a data scientist. Um, and here's some reasons. Of course, big data. Everybody's inundated with big data. High performance computing is inexpensive and accessible. Uh, we have talented trainees, like the, the trainees here that are uh, getting the dual PhD. There are lots of new training programs, uh, lots of students entering the discipline now. A um, uh, lot of new programs in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, there's government recognition. Um, the NSF and the NIH slowly but surely are investing more resources into both uh, informatics infrastructure but also funding opportunities and have realized uh, the, the, the importance of informatics uh, for, for research. Um, industry recognition, right? Uh, uh, companies are hiring informaticians as fast as we can train them. We did a joint search with the genetics department at Penn last year. Uh, and uh, made two offers, and these two individuals could have gone to any university in the country, publishing in science and nature, two of the best, best people on the job market. Both of them decided to go to Google. Um, we were very disappointed to learn that, but uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting time. Um, the indus industry-university relationship, I think, is, is very interesting. I know another group of uh, computer scientists uh, that I've interacted with over the years that uh, we're bought up by Uber and are set now setting up research labs at Uber, so uh, it's a very interesting time. Uh, patient recognition, right? We as patients um, are expecting to be able to access our own uh, electronic health record data through the web, and uh, this is one of the great things about electronic health records is they're making that possible. So there's patient recognition that, that information and, and informatics is important, and of course, university investment. Uh, at a time when a lot of universities are cutting budgets, scaling back programs, even eliminating departments, um, they are investing in the computational data sciences informatics. I think uh, the Network uh, Institute here is a perfect, perfect example of that. So uh, this is the golden era, and, and if you're an informatician, a data scientist, this, this is our time. I mean, how wonderful to be in this career at this time when what we do is so valued and invested in and is a growth industry with no sign of slowing down. Uh, I, I feel privileged to be an informatician. So what can we expect in this golden era? Um, I'm gonna tell you about some of the work we're doing in artificial intelligence, which I think is ready for prime time. Uh, biomedical devices are a big area. Data integration is huge. Data science, of course. Uh, this idea that I've been uh, pushing uh, informatician scientists, that we as informaticians should be leading research projects rather than being seen as the consultants or collaborators. Uh, network science, of course. Uh, no boundary thinking. We as informaticians can look across disciplines in a very no boundary, no discipline way uh, to ask more impactful scientific questions. And visualization, which is one of the areas I'm really interested in but don't have time to say much about today. So this is just a quick outline. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of AI uh, for those of you not familiar with, with this particular area and then talk about my motivation for using AI and data science, uh, tell you about a new uh, project, uh, software package that we're developing and then hopefully there'll be time at the end to circle back to network science and the impact that networks can have uh, in AI. 
So just a little bit of history. Artificial intelligence, of course, is the idea that computers can plan, solve problems and reasons and reason. And Alan Turing, a great computer scientist in the 1950s, raised the question, can machines think? And how would you know if a machine could think? And that uh, be became what we affectionately call the Turing test. In other words, if you woke up in the morning, sat at your computer with a cup of coffee, logged into Facebook, and started having a conversation with a friend, and then later you realize that uh, you find out that your friend was actually sleeping and you were actually talking to your friend's computer without knowing it. The computer would then be said to pass the Turing test. In other words, it, it could function for all intents and purposes as a human and no human could tell the difference. It's actually an interesting time because uh, there are artificial intelligence uh, software now that are uh, starting to claim to pass the Turing test. So we're kind of in that phase now, instead of talking and dreaming about passing the Turing test, we're actually starting to live it. There are two types of AI. Uh, Top-down AI is the idea of building a machine that mimics how the human brain works. Um, this was Isaac Asimov's idea of the positronic brain. Um, everybody's familiar with the character Data from Star Trek, right? Data had a positronic brain and um, but we don't, I know there are a lot of neuroscientists here, and, and there's a lot of really exciting neuroscience going on here at IU, but you know, we don't really understand how the human brain works yet, right? Uh, which is why we're so in, in, intensely investigating it, but how, how can we build an artificial brain if we don't even understand how the human brain works? So I think we still have some work to do in neuroscience before we're ready to really build a top-down AI. What most of us do is bottom-up AI. We um, you know, things like neural networks, right? We start with small subcomponents and, stu and, and, and study their interactions to do some interesting computation. So deep learning is an example of bottom-up AI. Just as a point of trivia, AI was coined, the term AI was coined at a workshop at Dartmouth College in 1956. Marvin Minsky and other founders of the field were there. Um, I was at Dartmouth before going to Penn, so this is a uh, an interesting factoid for me, and this is a quote from that meeting. So AI's had an interesting history in medicine, and I think more generally, uh, when computers first came on the scene in the 1960s, uh, there was a lot of excitement, um, and that's the, people often ask me, why, why do you have a picture of a little girl in red there? But she's, she's excited, right? This is what, what computers and AI can do, and, and there was tremendous excitement at that time uh, about AI, and then, of course, that led to hype. Right, and once you start dreaming of what a technology can do, then you overhype it as a way to get other people excited about it, get resources so that you can develop it. Um, but the the overhyping led to what uh, we now call the AI winter. We went through kind of a time when AI did not deliver on the promises that were made, became a dirty word. Uh, a lot of AI researchers went underground and kept working on AI, but not really publicizing it too much. And then in 2010, uh, everything changed with uh, IBM Watson, and I'll, I'll say a few words about that in a minute. But just as a point of history, this was one of the first uh, examples of AI in medicine was Ted Shortliff's Mycin program. Ted uh, was a graduate student at Stanford uh, in the early 1970s when he developed Mycin. This is a type of AI called an expert system, so sort of a rule-based system. Uh, and he developed this system to help uh, clinicians prescribe antibiotics for patients coming into the intensive care unit. Uh, and so um, here you have a medical microbiologist that has some knowledge, so you acquire that knowledge, you develop some rules, uh, then uh, you need some patient data, you collect data from the patient, uh, and then the rules and the data together get fed into an explanation system, uh, which um, actually makes the prediction, this is all based on probabilities and rules behind the scenes, uh, but makes a probabilistic statement about what, what medication you, you should prescribe. But what was really interesting about this is it worked, and it worked better than humans prescribing antibiotics, so that was pretty exciting, but it was never used in clinical practice, mostly because they were worried about the lawsuits uh, that would come about. So you can imagine having a loved one in the ICU that would have been in a car accident, uh, they develop an infection, and a computer prescribes the antibiotic, and your loved one passes away. Um, you can imagine you'd be pretty upset if you found out a computer did the prescription and not a human being. So that was why they never actually implemented it. So today we have Watson, and uh, I, I, I think for the young people in the room, uh, this was a very, very major milestone in um, 
computer science and informatics. Um, and it was a, a real tour de force, right? Bringing together things like natural language processing, information retrieval, knowledge representation, automated reasoning, machine learning. These are all really big areas by themselves within computer science and informatics. And Watson was able to pull all this together and put together a system that could beat the Jeopardy champion. Uh, and interestingly, uh, the raw material that Watson used was 200 million pages of information, mostly from Wikipedia is my understanding, about four terabytes of information. They had access to 2,800 compute cores, 16 terabytes of RAM, and no internet connection. So this was a self-contained system with 200 million pages of information that was able to beat, beat the Jeopardy champion. This, this was a real turning point, right? This, this was a milestone that said, AI is ready for prime time. AI can do things better than humans can. Now, of course, IBM uh, is, is wrapping its entire business model around Watson and uh, has been selling Watson to academic medical centers. Uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and MD Anderson Cancer Center were early adopters of Watson. Uh, and you can see some of the panels here, um, you know, the basic idea was to extract as much knowledge from uh, the oncologist as possible, give that to Watson along with a bunch of data, patient data, and then have it predict what um, chemotherapy a patient, a cancer patient should have. Now, um, there's been a lot of hype uh, for coming from IBM around Watson, and uh, for the most part, Watson has under-delivered on this problem of, of accurately uh, uh, predicting uh, chemotherapy, and in fact has uh, under-predicted to the extent that MD Anderson has pulled out of Watson after investing $60 million in. Imagine spending $60 million with a company to provide a service and then finding out it doesn't work as well as your oncologist and then pulling out. Um, and that was a big setback for Watson. Uh, this is a Forbes uh, piece by Matthew Herper from uh, February of this year. MD Anderson benches Watson in a setback for artificial intelligence in medicine. Um, I think the problem here, my understanding, talking with people and reading about this, is that um, IBM was pushing this technology out a little too quickly. Yes, it beat the Jeopardy champion, but it wasn't quite ready for prime time healthcare. Uh, still needed to cook a bit longer, and, and IBM, I think, pushed it out the door a little too quickly in an effort to capture the corner, corner of the market on AI and healthcare. Um, and, and as a result, there's been a fair amount of negativity about Watson. I think much, some of it's fair and some of it's not fair. I ran across this piece in Gizmodo that, that says, IBM Watson is the Donald Trump of the AI industry. It's like, I'm, I'm not a huge Donald Trump fan, but that's pretty harsh, right? I don't think... I don't think Watson. Uh, I don't think Watson um, deserves quite quite that level of uh, negativity. But um, but nonetheless, I think it's a sign that uh, there's a lot of scrutiny of uh, of this approach. And and I, I think IBM probably has done a disservice to the AI community by overhyping its product. Okay. So what I'm really interested in is using AI for data science. Um, uh, you know, data science is not easy, especially machine learning, right? It's, it, there are a lot of steps, a lot of, uh, a lot of decisions that need to be made, a lot of expert knowledge that you need to have, a lot of training. And so one of the big questions I'm interested in is can we automate this? Can we use a computer to automate data science and machine learning? So this is how I think of the data science pipeline, and I'm just going to step through these one at a time. Um, starting on the left there with uh, data, data integration, feature selection, feature construction, machine learning, interpretation, validation, and application. So I'm just going to step through these quickly. Of course, everybody gets big data, but I, I like this, slot, this figure of big data because uh, this is how I think about big data, at least in the healthcare domain, right? We have lots of different kinds of big data coming together that are being integrated in the electronic health record in our data warehouse. Uh, and that, that makes big data, not only is it big, but it's uh, very complex. Uh, data integration uh, is huge right now. How do we put all these pieces together so that an AI can chew on it? Um, uh, at the end, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about graph databases, but if you're not familiar with graph databases, I highly recommend looking into them. I think they're going to come on the scene really strong in the next few years, and uh, it's, it's basically an all, a very flexible alternative for integrating data uh, that takes some of the heavy lifting out of what we normally put into developing relational databases. 
Now these next two slides I think are incredibly important for machine learning in my experience. The first is feature selection. Big data, of course, is many features, many variables, right? We have millions of features, millions of variables, certainly true in genomics and electronic health record data. And uh, not all those are important. In fact, many of them probably are not important for whatever problem you're trying to solve. So the question is how can you eliminate many of them so that you can really focus on the features that have the highest likelihood of being important and that helps scale the problem to something a little more manageable for, say, a machine learning algorithm. And there are two ways to do this, that you can use uh, statistics uh, or uh, computational algorithm shown on the top of this figure to select features that are the most informative. Uh, we've done a lot of work on relief F-based methods, which I like a lot because they can detect synergistic interactions in data, things like gene-gene interactions. Um, and then on the bottom, of course, biological knowledge. So if you're studying a human disease, why not, why ignore everything you know about that disease uh, when choosing, uh, when doing a machine learning analysis? We, if you're studying diabetes, we know a lot about diabetes. We know a lot about glucose metabolism, insulin metabolism. Let's use that knowledge to help guide the machine learning algorithm and focus it in specific areas. Um, so I think uh, both st statistical, computational, and, and uh, domain-specific feature selection plays a very important role. Uh, and then feature construction or feature engineering um, is also, uh, I think, a very important area. Data doesn't always come to us in the format that the machine learning algorithm needs or wants. It, uh, um, data can often be recoded or combined in a way that uh, makes it much easier for the machine learning algorithm to detect uh, the right pattern. Uh, I've done a lot of work in this area over the year and I, years, and I, I really think feature selection and this kind of feature engineering together, if you do a good job of those two things, it makes the machine learning so much easier. It's, it's much less work that the machine learning algorithm needs to do. It doesn't have to discover those things, right? You've, you're giving it to it. All it has to do is what it's really designed to do, which is find the pattern. So that brings us to machine learning. Of course, there are many different machine learning methods and um, each one has different strengths and weaknesses. And when you start a data analysis, you have no idea really what machine learning algorithm is best for your data because you don't really know what the pattern is that you're looking for. And I love this figure um, because uh, it, I think it nicely illustrates how different machine learning methods look at data differently. And depending on what pattern it is, any one of these could be ideal for your data. It was an interesting side note. I was giving this presentation to our, um, our health system, uh, University of Pennsylvania Health System, and the CEO of our health system was sitting in the front row. And I was explaining this figure in more detail than I'm explaining to you. And I could see his eyes light up. And, and he told me for the first time he understood machine learning. Uh, so this is a, I like this slide. This is a powerful slide. I, I was able to have a breakthrough with our CEO. Um, so once you have a machine learning uh, model uh, that you're happy with, the next job, of course, is statistical and biological interpretation. Uh, I think networks uh, have an important role to play here. We've done a lot of work on using networks to te tear apart, tease apart machine learning models to really in in interpret what's going on, looking at relationships between different features, both, uh, both computationally and biologically. Uh, and then you want to do experiments, of course, to validate, and then hopefully you get to the point of changing healthcare. That's that's the goal. So why artificial intelligence? Well, what I'm deeply interested in is the process by which each of us analyzes data. So if I were to give everybody in this room a data set and say, let's come back tomorrow and compare notes after you've done an analysis, each of us would feel our way through that data set in a different way. You know, humans are are naturally tinkers, right? We like to tinker with data. So what's the first thing you do when you get a data set? You try something you're familiar with, right? I know how to do linear regression. I'm gonna do linear regression on this data set. Uh, maybe you know something about um, random forests. So you try random forests. Uh, and then, uh, so you try the things you know, and then you might learn some new things to try. Um, but each of us feels our way through the data set um, gets feedback, right, about what's working, what's not working, and each of us would take a different path through a data set. And given infinite time, maybe every one of us would explore every single possible method and, and arrive at the same set of results, but given a finite amount of time, uh, there's quite a bit of variability in how individual people analyze data sets. So, but that's a, it's, it's a good process, right? Humans 
we draw on our training, we draw on our expert knowledge, our experience, and that's how we feel our way through a data set. So I'm interested in that process. Can we get a computer to do that? And so we've been working um, uh, for the last two years on what's called automated machine learning, and I'm not gonna talk about our first algorithm today called Teapot, Tree-Based Pipeline Optimization Tool. I'll show you a webpage at the end where you get more information about that, but we've built a system for automating the machine learning process, the pre-processing, the feature selection, the feature construction, the machine learning. Uh, so you let the computer pick the different pieces and parts and put them together into an optimal pipeline, and we've had a lot of success with that. What I want to do today is tell you about another system we're developing called Pen AI, which is an accessible artificial intelligence system. And I believe that AI should be open, easy, and accessible. So we live in the big data world. Machine learning technology is there and it's matured very nicely. The software is there, the high performance computing is there. All the pieces and parts are there. Why everybody should be doing machine learning who wants to. Why not, right? Well, the reason no, everybody's not doing machine learning is because it's hard. There are a lot of barriers to jumping into machine learning. You have to learn Python, you have to learn R, uh, you have to learn some of the details of machine learning and how to interpret the results. So there are a lot of barriers to jumping into machine learning. So what I wanna do is how can we make this technology easy and accessible the same way the statistics community, right, made SAS and, and uh, Stata and other user-friendly stats packages to bring statistical methods like ANOVA, linear regression, logistic regression to the masses. So that's what I wanna do with machine learning. So this is the, uh, the system we developed uh, that we call Pen AI. Uh, it has the following components, and I'll just step through these one at a time. So the first thing we needed was a machine learning engine. We needed the, the raw materials to do machine learning. So fortunately, we didn't have to create this ourselves. Uh, there is a very sophisticated machine learning library out there called Scikit-Learn, which is all in Python. This is a very well-run project, professional. Uh, they have good funding. Uh, and they have provided numerous different machine learning algorithms, very comprehensive set. Uh, in Python, so for doing classification, regression, unsupervised methods like cluster analysis, uh, pre-processing methods, data transformation methods. Uh, so they have a very extensive list. So what we do is um, uh, use these machine learning methods and, and, and the code as, as the base for Pen AI. So these are the possible methods that Pen AI could, could choose from. Okay, so the next thing we need is a controller uh, to for the, because we want to build an AI that can launch machine learning jobs automatically, okay? So that's the goal of this. So we need a controller that can grab your data, grab a machine learning algorithm, throw it on the cluster or in the cloud, get the result back, and then do something with that result. Now, we had started planning to code this ourselves and had started developing this, and I actually ran across this GitHub project called uh, Future Gadget Lab, which does exactly what we wanted to do. So it turns out we didn't have to build this either. Uh, this is a really nice little set of tools to allow you to do exactly what I said. It'll launch machine learning jobs, get the results back, um, and keep track of them. And so this is what we use. So we combine this with uh, the scikit-learn library, put those two pieces together. So now we can launch any machine learning job get the, and get the result back. So the next thing we needed was a database. Um, and um, my... Uh, plan was to go with uh, no SQL databases, like a graph database. And so what we ended up using was MongoDB. And so when the controller grabs a machine learning result, it puts it in JSON format and then sticks it in a MongoDB database. So we didn't have to build a relational database, right? MongoDB is a document store. So you just take your results as a, treat it as a document it's in a certain format. Uh, and stick it in there. Uh, and now we can have a memory of every machine learning analysis that we do or that the AI does uh, in a database. I mean, what happens when, you, when a student or a postdoc takes a data set, does a bunch of analyses, they pick the best, we pick the best analysis and publish that, but all the other things you try sit on your hard drive and are never seen again. Well, here's a database where we can put every machine learning re result we generate on every data set that we're interested in and have a complete memory of that. And this is an important part of the AI because the AI want, we want the AI to learn from previous experience uh, and then uh, launch, uh, be able to launch using that expert knowledge of past performance to launch new machine learning jobs. Okay, so now we have a database. And by the way, MongoDB, the newest version, has graph capability. So you can link 
in a graph, in a network, your documents based on metadata, keywords, whatever is important, right? So if these two results were generated by a random forest algorithm, then a link is drawn and those two items now have an edge in a network. Uh, and then having a network of documents then allows you to do semantic queries and other interesting things and hopefully talk a little bit more about that at the end. Okay, so now we have all these pieces, and this is what we've spent the last year doing, is putting all these pieces in place. So we got it all working. The last thing we needed was an AI engine. So this is, this is why we're doing this, right? We want, we want to do automated machine learning, and we want a system that can learn from experience. So now that we have a database of machine learning results, we can take from that and do an analysis on the, machine, on the different machine learning results. So what we do is create a file that looks something like this, where every row is a different machine learning analysis. Uh, on it, and you can see the, first, the second column is data set, so that's an indicator variable that indicates what data set was used. Then if you skip over a couple columns, the ML1P1 is machine learning method one parameter setting one, so we have an indicator variable that says what machine learning method was used, what parameter setting was used. And then the last column is the area under the ROC curve, so this is a measure of the quality of a machine learning result. This could be accuracy or error or anything you want. Um, so now we have a matrix of results. We have methods, uh, we have data sets, we have performance, and then we can do an analysis on this and figure out what machine learning methods, what parameter settings are working best across all prior analyses. Um, and build from this a, a recommender engine. So that's what we did. Uh, and uh, so we ranked the machine learning methods and the parameter settings from best to worst, and then we have a recommender engine that can uh, two things. First of all, recommend to you the next machine learning analysis you should try, uh, or push a button and let the AI do the analysis for you, and it just starts picking off what it thinks are the best machine learning methods for your data, uh, and then launching those in the cloud automatically. So we're generating knowledge uh, about machine learning performance from prior results. Uh, the MF uh, features in column three and four are meta features. So these are other characteristics of your data set that might be important, right? C certain machine learning methods might work on better on certain kinds of data, uh, continuous measures or discrete measures, or you know maybe the correlation structure in the data is important. So this is a new feature we're getting ready to add is this ability to um, take into consideration meta features of the data that you're loading and analyzing. So this is just an example of a decision tree run on this exact data set here, just so you can get an idea. You could use a decision tree for this or any other modeling approach. Uh, I actually have a postdoc in the lab developing deep learning strategies for analyzing these data to, to make predictions about what machine learning methods should be used. All right, so now we have a fully functioning system. We've got an AI piece. Uh, we've got all these other components. Now we need a way to interact with this in a very user-friendly way. So we designed a graphic user interface. When you log into Pen AI, this is what you see. Um, you see your data set. So every square on the screen here is a different data set uh, in your portfolio. And then we show um, the best machine learning result thus far. Uh, so you can see that top left one is a random forest classifier. It shows the accuracy in the purple bar of, the, of uh, how, so you get a snapshot of the performance of that machine learning method on, on your particular data set. You can see uh, down at the bottom, how many experiments, uh, analyses are pending, how many are running in the cloud, how many results you have in the database for that data set. So for that first one, uh, that first adults data set, there are 26 machine learning results in the, in the database thus far for that method. Now you can click on that result. I don't have a slide for this, but if you click on that result, you get a, a, a table that has all the results, their performance, you can sort from best to worst or worst to best. Uh, you can sort by methods, it's in which case you can see all the, all the different parameter settings that have been explored. So at your fingertips, you have access to all the detailed information of all the results in the database through, through, this, through this GUI. Now at the top of each panel, uh, you can see this AI requested button. So that's the AI button. So like I said, you can use the AI in two ways. If you go to build new experiment, the blue box, and click on that, I'll show you that slide here next. But if you click on that, you can do an interactive machine learning analysis. You can do it push buttons and do machine learning by hand. Um, and the AI will recommend to you, it'll automatically populate that slide, I'll show you in a second, the, uh, the method and parameter settings. So the AI will recommend to you a starting point. So you can do the machine learning interactively. 
Or you can flip that switch and just let say, hey, I, I just want to let the computer do the analysis. Uh, I'm going to be lazy, turn that on. And this is really fun to watch in real time. And you'll see that button flash as it sends off machine learning jobs into the cloud. And then you'll see the results ticker increase as the results come back from the cloud. And we actually have Amazon running on the back end of this. Um, and so then you just let the AI do the analysis for you. Now this is really cool because, and every AI generated result is also going into the database. So the AI at some point is learning from its own analyses, right? So that's uh, kind of an interesting feedback loop. All right, so if you click on that launch uh, build experiment, this is, the a this is the machine learning page. So this is where you can do an interactive machine learning analysis. And we've, we've, uh, you know, we've dumbed this down a little bit for, we're really at this first stage targeting the most naive users. So if you're a computer scientist and a machine learning expert, you're probably not gonna use this. But if you've never done machine learning before, we wanna make it super easy for you to do machine learning. This is so easy, a two-year-old can do this. This is iPad friendly, iPhone friendly. You can, have this, you can put your two-year-old with a tablet in front of this and they could be doing machine learning and AI. So you, you click on a method, we've got six common methods here. Uh, and then when you click on a method, you get the parameter settings. This is all touch enabled, so you can do this from a touch screen. So you just push the buttons, hit launch experiment, runs in the cloud, the result comes back and goes in the database. So then when you're browsing the results and click on a result, uh, this is the dashboard that we're developing for showing the confusion matrix, the ROC curve, the training and testing accuracy. Um, and uh, we're also getting ready to add another panel to this on uh, ranking the features from most important to least in important using uh, the permutation approach where you permute, uh, you permute that particular feature. It's basically a sensitivity analysis to see how important that feature is on the machine learning results. So we're getting ready to add that feature as well. So that, then you'll get a list of your top, say your top 10 most important features on here. Um, okay, so that's the system. It's working. Uh, we're beta testing it right now. I've got a group of about six, 10 undergrads that are testing this for us, playing with it. Um, I'm meeting with them next week actually to get feedback about what they like and don't like. And, uh, and then the next thing that we're working on right now is an experiment. We want to really document in a scientific way, a scientific paper, uh, how, it, how Pen AI is learning, how good it's learning, um, maybe develop some new recommender engines for it. So we have this paper coming out on what we call the Penn Machine Learning Benchmark Datasets, PMLB. There's a GitHub project on this. So these are datasets we have taken from sources like the UC Irvine repository. We've cleaned them up, uh, put in metadata, and put them in a GitHub project. So they're ready to go. They're all formatted for scikit-learn. So if you're using scikit-learn, you can, you can, here's a battery of datasets that you can try out. Uh, and this is a figure from that paper showing the performance, darker blue is better, of different machine learning algorithms on the uh, y-axis across the 160 different data sets on the x-axis. And you can see there's some variability in performance. Machine, uh, machine learning methods like gradient boosting seem to do pretty well across most of the data sets. Uh, some data sets like 70 to 80 are more challenging for some machine learning methods. So there's a bit of variability in here. I, I actually don't think this is perhaps the best um, benchmark data set, and we have some other projects to develop better benchmarks, but this was a good starting point because we know these data sets, we've exhaustively analyzed them using lots of different machine learning methods and parameter settings. And so what we're doing right now is an experiment where we, uh, we bundle up um, Pan AI, the whole system in a Docker container with the 160 data sets in a random order we send it off to Amazon and say, okay, start analyzing the data sets. So it analyzes them sequentially. So it builds up its knowledge base as it goes. And the question is, how is it learning over time? Does it, does it, is it learning gradient boosting seems to be the best classifier for most of these data sets, um, for example. Uh, so this is just the flow chart of the experiment that we're doing. And then we're going to repeat that entire experiment a thousand times. So we're, we're in the process right now of running this experiment, working out the bugs, and uh, getting this done so we can write a paper on it. If you're interested, I know some of the students have, have seen this paper. We have a paper on archive. Uh, this is the paper, a paper we wrote in the spring to basically just give a high-level overview of the system and, and some of the issues uh, that, that we're dealing with. Um, this is going to come out as a book chapter later this year. Uh, but it's on archive if you're interested uh, in maybe a, little, a few, few more details uh, about the Pen AI system. 
uh, the next paper we'll write is this experiment, documenting this, this experiment that I just described. We have a website, uh, penai.org, where you can uh, get more information, keep tabs on what we're doing. I'll post updates here. Um, and then if you're interested in this broader kind of area of automated machine learning, I've got a website that I put up this summer called at automl.info uh, that basically talks about this general area of automated machine learning, uh, mentions some other efforts. Um, Turns out we were one of the very first to jump into this area. There are a couple other efforts, mostly in Europe, interestingly. Not many, I'm not really aware of any group, other groups in the US uh, doing much of this. Uh, there are a couple European groups. Uh, auto Weka, if you're familiar with the Weka machine learning package, there's an Auto Weka project, there's an Auto Splurn project, um, and a couple others. Uh, so we listed some of those here. We mentioned Penn AI, we mentioned Teapot, which is the pipeline building program that I talked about. And we've been getting a little bit of attention for this project. Um, this was a, a, a writer that contacted me and did an interview for Motherboard uh, and was really intrigued by this idea of accessible, open, user-friendly AI. And, you know, with the idea that, you know, IBM Watson's expensive. MD Anderson spent $60 million on Watson. I mean, that's a lot of money. Uh, we plan to put our pen AI out there for free. Uh, we're going to roll it out in the next few months to the pen community and open it up so everybody at pen can do this. Uh, and then we'll put this out as open source on GitHub sometime next year when we feel that it's ready. So we plan to release this to the entire world. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to claim we're going to compete with IBM Watson. I think they have a lot more horsepower than we do. But we are going to be able to bring this kind of AI technology to anybody that absolutely anybody that wants to use it. And this this writer was very interested in this idea of democratizing AI, and the questions he was asking me were all all around that particular area. And and as a side note, I've talked with Penn about Penn AI with a lot of clinicians in the last year, and clinicians are very uh, wary of these commercial. Packages, you know, IBM Watson's going around making sales pitches to every academic medical center in the country. Problem is, it's a closed system, right? You don't, you don't know what the code's doing. They don't tell you because that's their proprietary business model, right? So, uh, if you're a clinician and you're uh, you're going to make a healthcare decision based on Watson, you'd like to at least know where that answer came from and trust it, right? There's a trust transparency factor here that's really important. So, Pen AI will deliver that. And we, you know, what I, what I want to do in the next year as we start to roll this out is um, put in place a button. When you choose your best answer and maybe validate it on a test set, uh, push a button that says, how? how? How did 10 AI generate this answer? And have, have it spit out, you know, a flow chart or something that says, okay, here's exactly how the system came up with this answer. And here's the code, right? Maybe a link to the code so you can go and look at the code and review it yourself to see if you trust it. So I think that'll be a very important aspect of this. And I think that's our niche with Pen AI is this idea of transparency. Okay, so I know there's some network folks in the room and um, what I'd love to do is just kind of brainstorm with you. Uh, I'm a network person. I've done a lot of network work over the years and big fan of network science. I think it has a very important role to play in all this. And so. You know, I've been brainstorming about how we can use network science in the context of something like Penn AI. So the first uh, area I thought of is, is this graph databases, right? Having all your data and, uh, in a graph database uh, with metadata and other things of interest, uh, I think is, is going to be revolutionary, frankly. And, um, uh, you know, so, so for example, one of the things that we've been thinking about is how, how do we do this with truly big data? How do you put a million features into Pen AI um, and have it have it be something that is computationally feasible? Well, well, what I'm the direction I'm headed, and we have an active project to do this right now, is to take like genome-wide association study data where you have a million genetic measurements um, and break them up into small data sets. So you've got, you can break them into genes or regulatory elements or pathways, right? So you chop them up into a whole bunch of small data sets where each one, each small data set is defined by something that's biologically important. Uh, and then throw those all into a graph database, right? So now you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of small files in a graph database and with appropriate metadata, you can link them together, right? So gene A and gene B might represent individual text files, tab delimited text files in a graph database. 
And the metadata might say they're both part of the same biochemical pathway. And so now you could design, give that information to Penn AI and let it uh, navigate a graph using expert knowledge as it's doing its automated machine learning analysis and then, and then work that metadata into the interpretation on the back end. So I think uh, that's a really interesting problem that I would love to explore sometime in the next few years is how we can, I mean, we're, we're parsing data into these small data sets, but how, how to build that and, and take advantage of the network structure uh, and the network properties in Penn AI. How, how, can, how can the artificial intelligence make use of that to do a, a more streamlined, faster analysis? Um, the second area um, is uh, expert knowledge. Uh, so if you're studying biological problems, we, we have tons of biological networks. And again, how can we use those biological networks uh, to help guide both the analysis uh, and the interpretation? And this, I just wanted to point this out to you. This is a great new resource that we've been having a lot of fun playing with. They're called HetNets. Uh, this paper just came out in eLife. Um, and uh, the first author is Dan Himmelstein. Uh, and Dan, I know personally, he worked with me as a high school student up in Hanover. He was a Hanover high school student uh, when I was at Dartmouth College and worked in my lab and then went to Cornell and did undergraduate work uh, and then went to UCSF as a PhD student and he developed pet nets uh, while at UCSF. So this, this is a knowledge base that integrates 29 different knowledge sources. It's one of the biggest knowledge bases I've seen, most comprehensive, and you can see here it, it uh, integrates genes, uh, biological processes, anatomies, symptoms, diseases, drugs, compounds, side effects. Um, so there's a huge amount of different knowledge sources that he integrates in here. And he put this all in a graph database. This is all in Neo4j. Um, and uh, you can see his network diagram here connecting all of these different things. So we use this in a paper. We've got a paper under review right now where we had done uh, we had, uh, I've got a postdoc doing bi-clustering methods, uh, took 14 uh, gene expression data sets for breast cancer, did his clustering algorithm, did gene set enrichment on top of that, found Go categories that were common, reproducible across 12 of the 14 microarray data sets. Using this database, we were able to find genes common to those Go categories, connect them to drugs, find those drugs that connect, those FDA-approved drugs that connect to the genes, but don't connect to breast cancer, right? So now those are candidates for repurposing. And we found a really, really interesting drug that uh, we hypothesized could be repurposed for breast cancer. Um, and so we use this database. Um, so I highly recommend taking a look at this, but I'm, I'm interested in how, again, how can we use these kind of knowledge bases uh, in, in, in the AI framework? So that's uh, second, using biological networks. And then the third thing I'll mention is results, right? We've got all these results we're dumping into the database, machine learning results, and you can build a graph, throw those into the graph database. So now you have data sets, right? You've got these results files. You could have images, right? Uh, plots of data uh, of results um, and throw all that into the graph database. And what can we learn from networks of machine learning results? I think that's a really interesting question. I, would, uh, I think that would be a fantastic project. All right, I'll stop there. I think there's a little time for questions. Um, I just want to thank uh, Steve Vitale that did a lot of the programming on the guts of Penn AI and pulled the open source tools together and got them all play, to play nice together. And uh, Sharon Tartarone developed and programmed the uh, interface and did a great job. Um, uh, uh, she, uh, she's my visualization programmer. Um, and uh, Bill LaCava is a postdoc doing the recommender engine work. Um, these are a few of my grants that support the work. My email, I'm on Twitter, uh, as you heard, uh, at morejh. And if you follow me, I'll do my best to follow you back. Uh, so I'll stop there, and hopefully there's time for questions or discussion. Love to hear your thoughts about how network science could be used in this framework. I'm sure there are other, other things, ideas that we could come up with. Yeah. Um, so I'm happy to come around with a microphone if you have a question. I also wanted to remind you there are sign-in sheets on your table if you'd like to join our uh, uni listserv to hear about uh, future talks, you could do that. Does anybody have any questions?
Thank you for the great talk. And uh, on the topic of automated machine learning, uh, I'm just curious, because uh, you didn't get, have time to go into details of behind the scenes, uh, but you mentioned like deep learning, which is essentially doing some of the automated feature selection engineering, if you will. Uh, but imagine uh, there could be other, different other approaches. So I think you're, you mentioned somewhere like uh, evolutionary uh, uh, computation and maybe some network science techniques. Uh, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on about uh, what are the best way, if you will, to approach automated machine learning. Yeah, so um, I'm personally, although I do some deep learning stuff in my lab, and, and the mention of deep learning in, in this context was to analyze the machine learning results, right? Not, not as a primary machine learning method, but to, to try to come up with a prediction engine for what machine learning method should be launched next. Uh, so, I, so I have a postdoc working on using deep learning for that, but that's his project and that's something he wanted to do. Uh, I'm personally not a big fan of deep learning and have tried to stay out of the deep learning, at least the methodologic area of deep learning. Uh, we do some applied work, but um, because they're, they're just too hard to interpret, right? That's the big problem with deep learning. And, and again, we've targeted Pen AI at naive users and uh, deep learning I just felt was too much for the naive user. At some point we'll probably put deep learning in, into the Pen AI toolbox so that it could pick deep learning to apply to a problem. Um, and, 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 and the extent to which that's available in scikit-learn, we'll be able to do that with Pen AI. So that's, that's my, my thoughts about, about deep learning. Um, evolutionary computing is something I've worked in my entire career, as we talked about earlier, and something I think uh, I just did an editorial thinking that evolutionary computing might be the next big thing after deep learning. Deep learning is kind of plateauing at this point, um, and people are starting to hunt around for what, what the next thing to, to grab onto is, and I think evolutionary computing has a lot of potential. Happy to say more about that if you guys want, but... Um, but we do plan to put some evolutionary computing-based methods in Pen AI. Uh, but again, that's not for the naive user. Uh, that would be for us. And one of the interesting things I, I didn't mention about Pen AI is I think uh, this experimental platform that I described for testing Pen AI is going to be a natural uh, platform for testing machine learning algorithms, right? Because you can run Pen AI on some data, see how it does, what answers it comes with, up with. And then you can put your machine learning method, your new machine learning method in there, and I think it would be a nice unbiased platform for testing new machine learning methods, whereas mostly what we do are very biased things, right, and sort of we always construct the data and the comparisons in a way that favors our particular machine learning algorithm. So I think Pen AI will be an unbiased way to test new machine learning algorithms. Thank you so much, Jason. Could you go back to the um, screenshot of the Pen AI with the four quadrants that showed the four different test sets? That um, just the question I had was, um, I'm not seeing on here. This it says the best result for, for example, for adults is the random um, forest classifier. I'm not seeing what the research question is. So doesn't it depend on which research question will determine which is the best result? So um, how does that get programmed in here? And maybe you skipped it because it was obvious, but it, I didn't see it. <laughs> no, that's a great question. I've gotten that question before, so that's a good one. And I, maybe I should put in a slide on that. Um, you, you have to, when you put a data set into Pen AI, you, you need to format that data set and construct it in a way so that a machine learning algorithm would answer the question that you have in mind, right? So we're, we're at this point, at least in this version of Pen AI, we're leaving it to the user to, to feed a data set that makes sense for the question that they're asking. Okay, good. So does that mean you would have then maybe multiple data sets for your data set called adult right. and adult, you could search and find the one that had the research question you wanted. Absolutely. And each one is going to have a separate right. entry. Okay. Thank right. you. So is, is gene A associated with my disease? So you make a data set for gene A, and then you make one for gene B, and then you make one for gene C, right? And then you turn Pen AI on for each of them and see what it finds and then compare the results. So that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Because like I said, you're not going to put a million features into this system. It's just going to be too big, too computationally intensive. Um, 
and I'm, I'm thinking we need to be smarter about how we parse up our big data to do these kinds of things. So I guess one of the things, a uh, separate question or thread of thought is on your idea to test machine uh, learning algorithms on this kind of unbiased test bed. Another really cool thing to do would be to go backward and look at already published results and see how they might have turned out differently, yeah. especially now that we have open data and people are making their data sets available. You could just kind of run this thing <laughs> constantly on everything and see what how does it compare to what people did? And then we could get some idea of what were the biases that went in the whole foundation of all science that we've been building everything on. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of how we're starting with some demonstration projects for Penn AI. I'm contacting Penn investigators that have published high impact papers with clinical data sets, you know, using standard methods and then saying, hey, do we have your data to run through this system and do a comparison? And, and so we've lined up a couple, couple nice data sets that are manageable, that have interesting clinical outcomes and interesting results to see if we can find something new or different with this. Yeah, so that's kind of where we're starting. But I agree with you, yeah. Hi, we had a question from the chat that I just wanted to read out uh, from the live stream. Um, they're asking what uh, software you used for the AI automation and uh, what the, the website is so that they can access more information from. Um, what software for what? Sorry, I didn't um, hear you. Oh, sorry, for the AI automation? The AI automation. Um, so that's the, the future gadget lab controller that I mentioned earlier in the talk, which is available on GitHub uh, as open source. So that's what we use to, um, to send the machine learning jobs off. The, the AI piece of it is our own code that we wrote, which will eventually we'll put on GitHub as well for the recommender system. That's all in Python. So everything in the system is Python based except, um, except the interface, which is all in JavaScript, HTML5. Okay, thank you.